Okay. Okay, folks. Well, thank you uh, for coming tonight. Let's keep our fingers crossed on this weather. Welcome to yet another virtual event with Neighbors on Call. I'm Susan Blunt, one of the directors of Neighbors on Call, and the other director, uh, Becca Zirkin, is here too. So um, we have two special guests tonight. We want to thank them for coming, State Representative Zach Hawkins, and, as well as Seth Morris, who's the Senior Counsel and Voter Protection Director for the North Carolina Democratic Party. Uh, thanks so much for your time with us tonight. Let's just go into a little bit of the instructions of how we're going to do things. Is everybody muted now? I'm hearing the squeakies and things. Okay. All right. So the main thing is to note on the bottom of your screen that there is sort of the leftish, there is a stop video. We'd appreciate it if everybody would um, stop their video now. It greatly improves the network performance. So if you can do that, and then we've put you on mute because uh, with this larger crowd, it makes it hard to carry on a conversation. So if you are just learning about Neighbors on Call, we're so glad you decided to join us tonight. Um, it's a group that's been started shortly after the 2016 election, and we commonly refer to it as NOC. Um, and it's an all volunteer grassroots group. Our goal is to flip at least one chamber in the North Carolina General Assembly in this 2020 election, preferably both. That will mean flipping six House seats or five Senate seats. There are activists all across the state of North Carolina working on this very thing, and NOC has an important role to play in it all. This is an especially important election this year because in 2021, the North Carolina General Assembly, as a result of the census, will do the um, redistricting that's done every 10 years. And we want to make sure that the Democrats are, have a seat at the table when this redistricting is done. We've spent the last 10 years fighting gerrymandering cases here and there, and it's time to just get that right now. Um, having fair maps is key to getting our democracy back on track and it takes reaching out to other voters like us. In 2018, we helped break the supermajority in that election in the General Assembly by knocking on over 15,000 doors. Now, because of uh, COVID 2019, this time we are phone banking instead, which is the next best thing to knocking on doors, which is something we just can't do now. So we're working with these four North Carolina House campaigns. Two we need to flip, which would be Nicole Quick's district in House District 59 over in Guilford, and Ricky Hurtado for House District 63 in Alamance. And we want to help retain Sydney Batch's seat in Wake County, as well as Representative Terrence Everett in uh, Wake Forest. The, both of those guys uh, won their seats two years ago, and we want to keep them there. Campaigning now for these state legislative seats um, will help us turn the ballot blue all the way up to the top. So that's why we're focusing there because we can uh, push the power of the Democrats up the ballot. So let me tell you, our fabulous team, and by that I mean you guys sitting out there tonight, have completed since March 29th, our first phone bank, about 850 phone bank shifts. That's pretty miraculous, and we really are so grateful for everybody jumping in and doing that. Now, we're going to encourage you. You know, we're ramping up. It's about to be fall time, and we are all having to uh, ramp up our game here. So we're encouraging everybody to sign up for two shifts in August, if you haven't already. Uh, big thanks to the 62 of you who have already committed to two or more this month. And we've got some new things ahead, which Becca is going to tell you about now. Becca? Hi, everybody. Um, so we know that uh, some people feel really uncomfortable about phone banking, and we have a lot of supports to help you out, and one new one that we're excited to tell you about. So the supports that we've had all throughout, that once you get into the phone banking routine, you'll see they really do help build a sense of community and make you feel that you are not alone, even though you are alone at home, you are with lots of other people, with the campaign crew and the not callers. So the way it works is you get a script and information about the candidate in advance. And then the phone bank starts with a training Zoom every time. And often the candidate is there to talk with you. And then you're all making your calls. And in parallel, during the phone bank, you can chat online with other callers from our group. So it's a really nice way to just 
feel connected to everybody and get help and just cheer everyone on. And you should also know we won't be trying to persuade any voters. This is about turning out other like-minded folks. Then at the end, everybody meets up again to debrief in a Zoom. So the thing that we're adding that's new this month is that you can request to be buddied up with a phone bank mentor. So they'll be with you the whole way by phone and text. They'll help you get started. They're, they'll answer your questions, you know, just um, back and forth during the whole phone bank. You have somebody there holding your hand virtually, of course. And so this month we have that option on August 15th and 22nd. And then we're going to roll it out for all the phone banks in September. So if you're feeling at all nervous about phone banking, we hope that you will give that a try and you just click that option when you RSVP for a phone bank at neighborsoncall.org. So now to welcome our two guests tonight. State Representative Zach Hawkins represents House District 31 in Durham. Before his election to the State House in 2018, he served as the first vice chair of the North Carolina Democratic Party, and he was a science educator in the Durham Public Schools. In 2018, he was named an NCCU 40 Under 40 honoree. Last year, he helped to recruit 2020 North Carolina House candidates and he always fights doggedly for voting rights, the environment, education, and equality. You can catch him talking about the biggest issues we face with really amazing guests on The Breakdown with Zach on Facebook Live. And in his day job, because all of that is not his day job, all in his day job, he works to remove financial barriers for students in need as the Director of Development for Student Affairs at UNC. He has a master's in biology from NCCU, and he is a native of Chocowinity, North Carolina. And Seth Morris, our other uh, guest tonight, is the senior counsel and voter protection director, a busy guy, let me tell you, for the North Carolina Democratic Party. As voter protection director, Seth manages the party's election administration advocacy, runs the voter assistant hotline, and I believe, uh, Sanji's going to put that number in the chat for you. There it is. I see it now. So the voter assistance hotline, which is 1-833-VOTE-FOR-NC, and oversees the statewide voter protection operation. He previously served as the voter protection director in the 2018 cycle. A graduate of the UNC School of Law, Seth has previous experience at UNC Chapel Hill and the NC Department of Justice and the NC Department of Environmental Quality and the General Assembly. He's a native of Salisbury, North Carolina. Now, first, Representative Hawks, we're going to ask, Hawkins, we're going to ask you to give us a brief update from the General Assembly. Let's hand it over to you. Do you need to be unmuted? There we go. Well, thank everybody for, uh, for allowing me to join you. Uh, this is absolutely amazing that everyone has taken you know, their time, their effort, uh, to, to flip North Carolina. And, you know, I've, I've been at this for a while. I started in college in 2000, and this really is the most important election, you know, of our lifetime. And uh, because everything is in the balance. And so what I'm going to do is, you know, give you a little bit of what's happening at the General Assembly, mainly through the eyes of House Bill uh, 1169. And that was, you know, our bipartisan election effort. Um, to, uh, to, to really, you know, move things forward, and it did. There were some things that were uh, not as, uh, not where we wanted it to be, but you know what, you can't win them all, especially with a Republican uh, majority. And so where we, where we are, um, but, you know, we'll go back in September, September 2nd, so hopefully we'll get a chance to move other things forward. Before we left, though, with, with 1169, um, the bill, you know, had, had the opportunity to reduce the, uh, the absentee ballot witness uh, requirement from two witnesses to one. And that was really based on data, believe it or not. Um, most North Carolinians live alone. Um, and we, we found that to be the case based on legislative analysis. And, and so that made it that much easier. Of course, there was a lot of, a lot of pushback, but it happened. It should have been done um, because we know people are not trying to commit fraud, but we were able to get it down to one. Um, and so um, also one thing that's really, really important is that this bill allows voters to submit an absentee ballot request by the form of email, online portal, fax, mail, or in person. And so prior to this bill, 
um, you can only do it by mail and in person. And so you can already see how much more convenient this process is, especially you know, uh, where we are with COVID-19. Um, what it also does is it gives counties a little bit more flexibility where they assign their poll workers, meaning you can work out of precinct. And so with uh, there being an aging population that generally works on the polls as officials, we wanted to make sure that A, you didn't tire uh, volunteers you know, out, you didn't wear them out, and you wanted to make sure that if there was a shortage, we could reach it by pulling from everyone uh, in your county. One of the things that um, is also really, really helpful is that uh, millions were allocated uh, to state matching funds to take advantage of the Federal CARES Act and the HAVA money. Um, and so, uh, again, that was, again, something, you know, we, we know that federal money can help. They don't, they don't take all of it, but at least they were willing to take this. And so that was an opportunity uh, for us to, to not only allow um, for uh, resources to be on the ground, uh, for boards of elections across North Carolina, um, but it, again, it leveraged uh, federal money. Uh, one of the things that it also uh, did is it beefed up election security and continuity of operations in case of a disaster. One of the, uh, the opportunities that I think uh, that we, um, we missed prior but got it right in this bill is that it gave an extension to what they call multi uh, partisan teams to assist uh, registered voters, especially those in congregate living. Uh, what we found, especially with COVID-19, is that um, you know there are a lot of folks who are in assisted facilities, and we want to make sure that they have an opportunity uh, to participate in what those MATs, as they call them, they're one registered voter who's a Democrat, Republican, that's certified by their party and by the Board of Elections. And so they have the opportunity to go out and, and assist. And so that, again, that's a really huge thing. That was something we tried to solve um, in 2019, but fell a little short, but got it right um, in this bill. Uh, there's tracking mechanisms, of course, for, uh, for the ballot, uh, which we thought were really, really important. I worked with Senator McKissick and a few others on that um, in previous years. But one thing that I want to make sure that we understand is that um, uh, the, the, the one thing about being able to submit online for the absentee ballot uh, there's about $400,000 that was allocated. And for people to be able to do it online, um, you know, we, we see the, the gap that's, you know, been provided, uh, the, the gap that's been exposed by COVID-19. But to be able to push this online um, is such a win for the average North Carolinian who will not feel safe going out in, in the elements. And so we made the process really, really easy. I know Seth, uh, and I will later talk about that, but I wanted just to provide uh, a few, a few, um, a few highlights. Um, a couple of other things that I want to make sure that you you all sort of understand uh, about what's on, um, you know, on the ballot here before we uh, move forward is that as the intros were were given, everything that is important to us is on the ballot, and that means breaking the majority. And so if if we are thinking about folks that don't have, you know. Medicaid, uh, who don't have access to, a, you know, uh, to affordable health care options, you really want to push um, to educate people about all the things that are in this bill, because the more information they have, uh, the more people we can get out to vote. If you have people that are really, that really understand that uh, draconian laws um, for the last 10 years have hurt North Carolina, and that in, in the middle of a pandemic, we can't serve adequately um, our students and our classrooms and our poorest individuals because um, we have not given the money, the kind of money to education that we should, and that we have not expanded broadband in the ways that we can for people across North Carolina. So the work that you're doing um, really is also essential to, to everyday workers, to essential workers uh, who don't have the rights that they need and the wages that they need. And so um, I'm so excited to sort of, you know, just give you that quick Overview. I know. I know. We're going to talk strategy a little later, but those are the the main highlights from um, uh, from House Bill 169. Again, we are going to go back in September on September 2nd to uh, hopefully uh, dole out more uh, federal money. We don't know um, how much because, of, as you well know, the uh, the federal government, and the House, and the Senate have not come to a compromise. Um, but we hope that there will be more. Uh, more money to give out because what we don't want to do is run into a situation like they did in Georgia and Wisconsin. 
And those were long lines. Um, there were, um, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, polls shut down unnecessarily. So we're going to be continuing to work with, with Seth and the party um, to make sure that um, every voter has the opportunity and all the precautions in place so they can, they can do so easily. Um, a few things that Marsha, Maury, and I uh, worked on and really fought to, to get into 1169, and I think someone just mentioned it in the chat, with the drop-off points, those, those, those ballot drop-offs. That would have been absolutely huge. One thing that we had the opportunity to potentially do, but we, again, they passed on it, was um, the opportunity to make Election Day a holiday. Um, that would have been an easy thing to do in the middle um, of a pandemic so that people had the opportunity uh, I see you, Donna Jones, uh, to have the opportunity to um, allow for uh, people to have the access and the time. Uh, because we know, um, as they did in Georgia and Wisconsin, people were in line, I think it was seven, seven to eight hours. I had friends down there who were in the General Assembly, and they said it was absolutely, absolutely horrific. So again, while this bill is not perfect, we got a lot of things done, um, but I'm, I'm glad that you're willing to fight with us to the end, because um, unless... Uh, then uh, in about 80, 84, 85 days, hopefully we will change and shock North Carolina and put us right on the, back, on the right path. So I'll pass it over uh, to Seth to talk about his part. Then we'll come back and talk strategy and ways uh, that you can um, uh, really get people energized when you talk to him over the phone um, and really get people excited about what's going to happen in November 3rd. Okay, let me jump in just quickly before um, Seth starts speaking. Uh, Representative Hawkins, uh, people were asking the Bill 1169, it did pass. It is currently in place, right? Whoops. Oh, uh, we lost your sound. <laughs> Un yeah, there. Yeah, so, um, yeah, there you go. Yes, it did pass. Yes. Okay, good. Just want to yeah, make sure. It, it, okay. it did pass. Sorry, I was muted. I apologize. I know it, did pass. it was a bipartisan bill, and again, it was it wasn't perfect, but it did in all those ways that I mentioned uh, move the ball forward. It made it a little easier uh, for folks in North Carolina. Okay, good. So before we jump in uh, with uh, Seth, I just like to say we've got a meaty discussion ahead. Buckle your seat belts. There are many, many questions, and we're going to ask folks to listen and see if your questions are answered, and then toward the end of their time. Um, put your questions into the chat. We're a little worried, frankly, about drowning in so many questions that we uh, miss. Uh, it's hard to pick out the ones that were answered and were not. So listen a little bit first, and if your questions aren't answered, then please do put them at the chat toward, toward the end. And Bonnie and Vicki will, um, uh, excuse me, Bonnie and Patience will do their usual thing of pulling out questions that they will then turn over to um, our guest here tonight. So let me turn it over uh, to you again, represent you and um, Seth have worked out your routine, and I'm not sure who you're going to speak next. Do you have Seth? Are you ready? So I can I can start. Um, okay. So I, I mean, first I want to sort of broadly provide some context of what the voter protection program is about and what my team does, uh, and then I'll delve into some of the real challenges that we see with voting in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, and, uh, and you know, some of the challenges we just see because of new Republican shenanigans that we haven't seen before. Um, and then I know there are always a lot of questions or have, there have been a lot of questions this year, particularly around um, vote by mail. And so I'm, I'm, I think we're both happy to take questions towards the end. Um, but broadly speaking, uh, the voter protection program does three things. Uh, first is that we advocate. Uh, so we advocated with the General Assembly about 1169 and with the State Board of Elections. Um, we also advocate with the County Boards of Elections to pass expansive early voting plans um, and are now for the first time engaging a lot with the County Boards of Elections on the matter of absentee ballot count and that process uh, to ensure that it's fair and, uh, and that every voter has a chance to ensure that their ballot is counted. Uh, the second is that we do a lot of education. So um, a lot of my day is just um, approving content, uh, making sure that the things that our organizers are saying and our communications team are saying and that um, others across campaigns or when they're talking to voters about voting that they're giving accurate information. Um, so I, I do that almost every day. And then the larger portion of voter education that happens in my shop is the voter assistance hotline. Uh, so that number, which is 833 868-3462 is a number that anyone can call 
uh, a voter, an activist, um, to ask a question or report an issue. Uh, so we get a lot of questions about vote by mail these days. Uh, in tradition, traditional years or typical years, uh, we get a lot of calls about, am I registered to vote? Where am I registered? Where do I go vote? Things like that. And then of course people call um, and report problems that they're having either at polling places or with their vote by mail ballots. And um, we try to help them resolve those problems. Uh, and then the third thing that we do is uh, we organize. And so I have a team of um, two deputies and, and seven regional organizers whose sole job is just to organize in their communities and be advocates in their communities. Um, and uh, those people all started today. Uh, my, my regional started today. So I'm really lucky to have a new team to amplify our efforts around the state. Uh, but they'll be helping to recruit poll observers and hotline volunteers and uh, generally sort of building out our network um, of advocates for absentee ballot count meetings, uh, advocates for voters at the polling places, um, and people who can report problems to us so that they can be dealt with in a timely manner. So that is the voter protection program generally. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about sort of the voting in a pandemic and, and the problems we in anticipate seeing uh and the the ways that we can go about sort of preparing for them or, or resolving them um you know the first thing is that we have seen this this huge influx and in interest in vote by mail so uh in a typical election about four percent of north carolinians choose to cast their ballot by mail um we have long had uh, no excuse absentee voting but it's not it's been historically underutilized. Um, typically, you know, North Carolinians go vote early. We've always pushed early voting as the best um, choice for voting. Um, and now this year, uh, both because of just organic interest and concerns about the pandemic, but also because a lot of outside groups in particular are pushing vote by mail, uh, we have seen, uh, as of today, uh, there have been seven times as many uh, absentee ballot requests as there were same date 2016 and that rate continues to increase it was five times two weeks ago six times this time last week and now it's seven times the, the same day rate so uh, we could see upwards of 30 or 40 percent of our voters wanting to cast mail ballots um, there are challenges with poll workers uh, so 58 percent of our poll workers are 60 or older um, and 25% are 70 or older, and many of those folks who fall in the, the risk population for COVID no longer want to serve. Um, so there is a sh statewide shortage of, of poll workers. I will note that in Orange County, there's actually a, a now a wait list because so many people have signed up uh, to be poll workers in Orange County. So I'm very appreciative of the folks over in, in Chapel Hill in Orange County for that. Um, and all of that, uh, the social distancing and sanitization um, may have two other kind of negative effects. Uh, one is that some precincts just won't be adequate for social distancing, and so they'll have to move polling places, and we'll have to ensure that voters have accurate information about where they need to go vote this year, because um, it will be different than where they voted in the past. Um, and we're trying to prevent that as much as we can. Um, and then the second thing is that because of the necessity to social distance and because of the necessity to clean periodically in a polling place, uh, voting in person will take incrementally longer for every person um, who votes this year. And all of those incremental um, you know, increases in time that an individual spending in a polling place uh, will, will create longer lines uh, throughout the day if a lot of people go vote on election day. Um, so in response, uh, to all of that, of course, the General Assembly passed House Bill 169, um, which was very helpful. Uh, I, it got us about halfway there. There were some things that we, you know, could have used that the Republicans just wouldn't go for. Um, and uh, also in response, the Board of Elections has really stepped up and is providing PPE to poll workers, uh, has taken on expanding early voting to include more hours than it ever has and more sites than it ever has before. Um, so. Ultimately, uh, what I tell voters and what I, I think your message to voters should be is that there are, there are three safe and convenient ways to vote in North Carolina. Um, early voting is going to be perfectly safe because adequate precautions are being taken right now. Uh, it'll be safer than going to the grocery store to vote in person this year. Um, of course, voters who want to vote on election day can still do that as that is the most sort of traditional way to vote. Um, and then if you want to vote by mail, uh, you know, you should absolutely do that. And the only thing 
sort of caveat I add is that after about October 15th, um, just because of concerns about the Postal Service and, and you know, if you have an error, error on the form that needs to be corrected, after about October 15th, I think that a voter should think long and hard about going to vote in person uh, rather than requesting a mail ballot. Um, there's just too much potential for, for um, issues there in those final three weeks that it's probably better just to go vote in person. Uh, so that's my spiel to voters is that you should just pick the method that works best for you. And we want to be here as a resource to make sure that you're doing it, you know, um, that you have the information you need to do it correctly. Uh, so, you know, pick a method and vote, do it as early as you can. If you're voting by mail, request the ballot now. Vote it as soon as you get it. If you're voting in person, go to vote early. Um, and, and do it in those sort of um, weekday times if you can uh, when they're off peak hours. Um, so, you know, pick a method now, make a plan, go vote is, is our message. Seth, we've been having, I'm afraid, a little sound problem from your end. I believe. Um, so, could, would you mind just saying again what the party is recommending that it's not just saying absentee, absentee? Just make that point again real strong. We got some bad sound. Issues. Certainly. Um, so our message to voters is that there are three safe and convenient methods of voting um, and that you should pick the one that works best for you. Um, and that, you know, we want to be a resource to a voter, uh, whether they choose to vote early or vote on election day or vote by mail uh, to make sure they have correct information. Just make a plan now and carry it out as soon as you can uh, to ensure that, you know, your ballots counted in a, in a safe and easy way. Okay, well, um, do you want to, um, do you have anything to add to that, Zach? No, no, I, I was just going to say, say the same thing. I think, um, you know, we know that many people are, again, are nervous about uh, going out in the elements, especially uh, those who have been impacted, those um, above a certain age and uh, those communities of color. And so if, as, as he mentioned, would, would like to go ahead and move forward with uh, the mail the by mail process on um, absentee they absolutely can and, and again it's incredibly easy and so i would and probably in follow-up would, would just want to make sure that we remind voters exactly all the way all the ways that they can do it and and especially for organizations so they can continue to sort of get the word out as well and as you're calling people uh, we want to make sure that uh, they're as informed as possible uh, the voting plan is huge um, especially for for elderly voters especially for those who um, are committed to going in person. Uh, the hours are great and they're standard. They're across the board. And, um, and, and having the ability to go between a, a 12 and a two or 12 and a four is much better um, than waiting on election day. And what, again, what we fear is because of, um, you know, long lines, potential long lines, um, we, uh, we don't want people to have to stand in line any longer than they have to. We don't want people to get discouraged and so the early voting period is the best, the best opportunity uh, for them to do that. But we are encouraging them to do what, they, what makes them feel comfortable. Uh, we are a little, um, I don't necessarily say worried. I don't know, Seth, you could chime in on that, on what um, is happening federally with the Postal Service, but do take the precautions. Um, do, what, do what's best, but then also best for you, but also think about um, uh, making sure that your vote gets counted towards the end. Right. So now, Becca, so I think maybe we need to start thinking about some of those questions. Yeah, I think that was, a, I think as phone bankers, we just got a really important message about what we need to be communicating to people on the phone, which is make a plan and you have three options that are viable for voting. And I think okay. we then have a lot of very detailed questions that we've been hearing from lots of folks that we want to ask you about you know, if we get asked this, we want the answer to, for example, absentee ballot. Could you walk us through that process, like, step by step? I want to vote absentee up until I actually do do it. What's the important advice I need to have? What are the things that are okay to do, not okay to do, when I need to get it done? Just step by step. Yeah. That's the most common question we get. Sure. I can do that. Um, I'll follow up. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, you know, the absentee ballot request form is the method by which you request a ballot in North Carolina. You have to use the official state form. Um, you can find that on the State Board of Elections website. Uh, you can print it off at home and either mail it in, fax it in, 
email it, um, or deliver it in person to your Board of Elections. Uh, beginning, uh, and, and that can be signed electronically, not with like a DocuSign signature, but if you have a drawn signature or a you know, finger drawn on a touchpad or a scanned in signature of yours, you can you know, fill the whole form electronically and put that signature on if you want to attach it to an email, for example, without printing it. Um, beginning September 1st, there will be an online portal by which you can request an absentee ballot. So that you'll just go to the Board of Elections website, fill out a form. Um, accompanying that, uh, there will be a tracking system that will be built into the, um, the online request form. So you'll be able to um, opt in to text messages or emails uh, for you know, when your ballot is gonna be mailed. Um, you'll get an alert, and then when they receive it back from you, you'll get an alert. Um, so uh, once you've requested the ballot, uh, they mail you the ballot, and ballots begin being mailed on September 4th. Uh, so voters can probably expect them. So that's a Friday, and it's a holiday weekend, so they'll probably hit mailboxes maybe the 5th uh, in some places, but more often probably the 8th or 9th is when people will start to get their ballots. Um, and you vote that ballot, you have to do it in the presence of a witness, uh, and that witness, um, then you, you, the voter, you put the ballot in the envelope on the back of the envelope. Uh, there is a place where you have to sign that you voted that ballot, um, and your witness has to sign and put their printed name and address that they observed you voting that ballot. Uh, and then you or a close family member um, or your legal guardian uh, can put that ballot in the mail uh, or hand deliver it to an early voting site or the Board of Elections office. Um, so that's sort of roughly the process for casting a ballot. And then those ballots will be counted at Board of Elections meetings that are held on a weekly basis starting on September 29th, uh, it's Tuesday, every Tuesday for five days up to election, or five for five weeks, excuse me, up to election day and then again on election day. So all of those ballots will, at those meetings, uh, the Board of Elections will look at the form and determine whether you properly filled out the, your signature and the witness portion. Um, and then they'll take the ballots out of the envelope and run them through a tabulator immediately following that meeting. Uh, so, that, so that those ballots are, are counted at that moment. Um, I think that's the process generally. I think that answers Yeah, question. yeah. I, I was gonna, can you, you know, Seth, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I was gonna say that um, a few of the questions in the chat, uh, can, you know, can, the, can, can the witness of a ballot be a relative? And that's, uh, that's absolutely, you know, yes, you, you, you can. Um, one thing I want to, um, to, to warn against, and I think I saw this in the chat related to sort of the process is that you know, if you receive something in the mail that comes from, I think someone said the Center for Voter Information, um, the, yeah, that's, that's not legitimate. Um, and so you don't want, uh, you want to make sure that if someone receives that, that they know that you should not receive an unsolicited ballot. And, and I want to say it's a, um, a felony for someone to, to you, know, you know, push um, or request a ballot that was not uh, solicited by, by that particular person. And so um, please be aware to either throw it away, call your board of elections, or call that entity so that um, uh, you know you you can verify. But nine times out of ten, it's best to to just throw it away and make sure that you and or um, uh, you know the person who can do it on your behalf has an opportunity to request request the ballot. And that's the way. That's the best way for you to ensure. That it's um, that it's legitimate because I again I saw it in the chat but that's one of the parts of the process that I hear uh, quite a bit. They say, "Well, what do I do if I just get something in the mail? Um, don't go for it. Don't fall for it at all." So, Seth, do you want to comment on that? <laughs> so, I, I disagree about the Center for Voter Information. Um, I mean, they're they're a progressive leaning C four. Um, they've made some mistakes in the past with those types of forms. But the one that they mailed out last week is is legitimate, and it's I mean it's a blank form. It's not partially prefilled. Uh, you know they provided you with the return address to your just make sure it's to your county board of elections, and you can use that form. Uh, there was a problem this summer. Where the CBI sent out uh, a small batch of 
those ballot request forms and they did partially pre-fill the form with some of the voters information and that was a problem and those had to be recalled uh, and boards are rejecting those but that last mailing they did last week they learned their lesson yeah. <laughs> and the mailing they did yeah, last they week did. everybody got um including my fiance and both my parents but not me apparently um, yeah, maybe that mailing you can send back and it's it's legitimate so yeah this is yeah, my, so, uh, my version of this my modified recommendation is okay so you got it maybe it's okay but why not just use the real thing just go to the orange county or whatever uh, uh, election site just get the real one and use your own stamp i mean it's yeah. not the mess yeah that's yeah, the that's, yeah that's uh yeah that's that's, that's exactly yeah. that's exactly what i say as well Mm -hmm. is just just go ahead and request it and, and he's right i mean for that uh, for the ones that uh, that group sent out they sent out a bad batch but some people are receiving from ones from other places too and so um we just want to make sure that um that people are are um are taking the time to uh, to to really think through the process and be extra careful um because we we want them to vote if you already submitted one, submitted one of these request forms, uh, you would hear back from your county board of elections if there was something wrong with it, right? So you, you won't sound like you have to go to jail. <laughs> you know, they'll let you know if it's a problem. So don't, I don't, I don't want people to be panicked or worried. That's so I'd like to ask a few follow-up questions to go with that, which is where are the problems that what are the problems you're worried about? What are the problems that can happen either with think, when I'm filling out my absentee ballot or when I'm filling out my actual ballot? Like I know there's concern about things, you know, not ha having trouble. So what are the common things that we just need to look out for? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of confusion around vote by mail because just not many people do it here. People have not historically voted by mail. So there are a lot of questions about that process. Um, and the, the things to look out for, to my mind, are just monitoring, um, you know, and your request if you make one. Um, you know, if, if you don't receive a ballot on, in the week of September 8th, call your Board of Elections and ask them where your ballot is or if they received your request. Um, after September 29th, you'll be able to look up uh, whether your ballot was accepted or rejected. So. I requested a mail ballot. Uh, I, I voted by mail for many years because I, I went to college out of state and just continued to vote by mail because it was convenient for me. Um, but, uh, you know, follow up to make sure on the Board of Elections registration lookup site uh, that your ballot was accepted or rejected. And I'm going to vote by mail again this year. I'm going to mail in my ballot as soon as I can, probably the day that I get it. Uh, and if it's not been counted by the time the early voting starts, I will call the Board of Elections and ask them if they received it. And if not, I'll just go vote in person. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm nearly certain that it will get there. Uh, so there's a lot of concern about that. That's why it's so important to do it early, right? Just do it early, make your request early, vote your ballot early. And if there are problems, you can follow up and you'll still have several weeks of early voting and election day voting to fix the problem. Uh, then, you know, people have concerns about our questions, often the question, questions like, um, if I request a mail ballot and uh, decide I don't want to vote it, is that, is that a problem? Do I have to vote it if I request it? Absolutely not. If you request a mail ballot, you can uh, just tear it up at home and go vote in person at an early voting site. Um, often you get the question about postage, uh, adequate postage. So, um, North Carolina's ballot envelope is designed to be mailed with one first class stamp. Um, however, uh, it is official postal service policy um, that any election mail be delivered if it has the official election mail moniker on it. Um, so even if, you know, for whatever reason it got wet and it came in a little over an ounce, um, they still have an obligation to, to deliver your mail, um, your election mail. Uh, so those are those are some of the big questions. I, I know that uh, there's sort of this question of um, a lot of people are moving right now, particularly college students may not be on campus in a few weeks. And, uh, you know, we're facing this sort of potential eviction crisis. So I get questions about um, should I request it now if I'm not sure where I'm going to be living in a few weeks? Uh, I would say if you're not sure, you should wait. Uh, and if, you know, once you're settled in your new location, if you need to re-register, you can, um, and that uh, you can always go vote in person. 
can always give it in person. So it's, it's not a problem if you wait to request a mail ballot until later. Um, so those are a few of the common questions. Um, you know, I, I understand why some people prefer to go vote in person and watch their ballot be put in the machine. I mean, that's, you know, you know, it's been tallied at that point. Um, but I feel confident in the mail process as long as people do it early enough to catch any errors that happen on the back end. If I get worried and I decide, oh my gosh, I'm not sure my ballot got there, let me go vote in person just in case, and then I end up voting twice, am I going to get in trouble? Um, you won't get in trouble because uh, there's an intent to that crime, um, and you're and only one of the ballots is going to be counted. Um, I mean, it, it would be nearly impossible for both ballots to end up being counted because as soon as you go vote in one way, I mean, it's noted in the in the the record. Um, and so if I, you know, for example, if I mail my ballot on September 8th and I call um, on October 13th and they say, yeah, we never got it, I'm going to go vote in person. I'm going to go vote in person the first day of early voting or the next day. Uh, and there's no penalty to that. My ballot has been lost in the mail. Um, and I'll just notify the Board of Elections of that. Um, so you should never intentionally do it, you know, never intentionally cast two ballots. But if there is a problem, check with your Board of Elections uh, to see if they've yet received it. And if they haven't, you know, you can, you can always give it in person. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Susan, do we want to ask a few more questions from our list before we turn it over to the chat questions? Okay, go ahead if you've got one picked out. Um, no, I think I'm ready. I think that I think the folks in the chat are going to cover every detail that could possibly be asked. Okay, Doug. Well, uh, we'll call on Paige and Bonnie then to take charge here. Sure. Okay. Wow. Um, that's amazing. About the sound problems. Is the Les, I think maybe you, is it possible you have two Zoom windows open or something? So we're hearing a reverb from you. No. All right. A weird Zoom glitch. Okay. Uh, a, a recent lawsuit uh, requires that minor absentee ballot, ballot errors be fixed. How's that going to work? Uh, we're not sure. <laughs> we don't know yet. Um, so the, the Board of Elections director is writing her peer plan now. Um, the things that we are advocating for are uh, that it be easy for the voter, that it not require any affirmative act of them mailing something in or showing up in person anywhere, uh, that they can just receive a phone call or respond to an email. Um, two, that uh, there be an adequate window of time that they can cure the ballot. So there's some concern, particularly after election day, that if you say, well, it has to be cured in three days, um, we need, you know, give people adequate time for follow up. Um, three, that there not be any discretion on the part of the um, Board of Election staff member who's who's assisting with the cure uh, to like make a credibility determination about the voter um, such that bias could creep in in any way. I mean, if a voter says they are they are who they say they are, um, their ballot should count. And you as a Board of Election staff member shouldn't get to decide whether they're credible and someone else, you know, isn't. Um, and then the fourth thing is that we're hopeful the cure process can be initiated as soon as the Board of Elections receives the ballot, rather than after it's been officially rejected by the board. So if I, if I mail in my ballot and it arrives at the Wake County Board of Elections on September 10th, rather than waiting until that meeting on September 29th, where it will be ex officially accepted or rejected by the Board of Elections, you know, the process should be that a Board of Elections staffer immediately sees there was a problem on the 10th, and calls me that day or on the 11th to try to cure it before that lag in time occurs. Um, so that's what we're advocating for are those four points. Um, there's some really good language in the opinion just about the due process concern, um, but we're not sure what the specifics will be from the Board of Elections. And the judge gave them a lot of leeway to sort of come up with their own cure plan. Okay. Is the photo ID requirement 100% absolutely not going to be in effect? I would say it's 99.99%. .99%. So there's, you want to speak to that, Representative Hawkins? No, 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 I was just going to say, I, I, you know, I, think, I think you're exactly right that it will not be 
in um, 1169, as, as Seth also you know, talked about, they tried to um, sort of insert um, a, um, a public assistance ID that uh, sort of tried to lead us back down that path. Um, but we, um, there's just really no, um, you know, no way in the world that we think that you know, uh, you know, a judge or anyone else is going to say that we need to do it, and we're less than 84 days away. And, um, and it's already, you know, you know, been litigated across the country that, you know, it, 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 in, it hurts certain communities. And those communities are ones that we know um, have a partisan link. So um, I'm, I'm with Seth on that one, that all indications are saying that we, um, we should not have to worry about a photo ID requirement. Like that. Okay. Um, Bob belongs to a group of low vision uh, voters, uh, a support group in Orange County, and he, he made a comment, note, neither the absentee ballot application form nor the absentee ballot itself is accessible for those who are blind or have low vision. This means those people cannot vote in a private or independent manner. They must have help. Um, I believe there's a lawsuit outstanding regarding this. Is there any chance that that will be resolved or not? I don't know uh, the status of that. I know that that litigation is ongoing. Um, I'm not sure what the status of it will be. And I also don't know whether the online absentee request form will be accessible to, to bond and low vision folks. Um, I hope it is. I hope it is, but I'm not sure about the yeah. technological capabilities there. Yeah, that's, that's definitely something for us to, uh, to follow up on with with the BOE and, and, and potentially a correction if we can and when we go back in September. Um, and, and also, you know, the ability for uh, those MATs, those multi-partisan teams uh, to be helpful in that regard. So I'm, I'm glad you, whoever asked that, because I'll, I'll take a note to follow up on that in a second. Too. Okay. Um, one of our um, attendees lives in Wake County and she's heard that observers are not allowed to observe the opening and counting of absentee ballots. Is that true? And if so, what can we do about it? So um, that process varies greatly from county to county. Uh, the approval of the ballots occurs at a public meeting. Uh, the opening and counting of uh, absentee ballots uh, isn't doesn't necessarily occur in public. Some counties do it in public, some don't. They're, they're rather, the sort of cure in the statute is that it just requires that all of the board members be there. So there have to be Democrats and Republicans in the room at all times um, to ensure that, you know, no one is, <laughs> there's no hijinks. Um, and uh, so some, in some counties, that's a, you know, they roll out the tabulator into the room where, where people can witness uh, and some, it's the whole board goes to wherever the tabulator is and ensures that all the ballots are put through. Okay. Um, we, we have some people who have parents in retirement communities who are concerned about them. And um, we've gotten a couple of questions. One question has to do with whether staff can assist the parent, you know, being a uh, a witness to the signing of the filling out of the absentee ballot, and another question asks: Are there multipartisan teams going into retirement communities around the state? My mom's in a skilled nursing facility that currently does not allow visitors from outside. So um, that was included in 1169. Was sort of a special. Um, I guess waiver for lack of a term, better term, to the traditional MAT process of, of folks going into nursing homes. And uh, what 1169 required is that the Department of Health and Human Services and the Board of Elections work together to come up with a plan for how people in congregate care facilities can cast ballots, recognizing that visitors can't go into those facilities, including multipartisan assistance teams. That plan is still under development, um, and and I'm not sure what will ultimately be proposed. Uh, that was all sort of on pause, because that was also being litigated in the lawsuit that was decided last week, um, and ultimately the judge uh, rejected the claim of congregate care residents who uh, wanted to vote without a witness um, and to be able to request their ballots and receive assistance from employees in in their facilities. Um, so. 
that was that's a problem the, the judge did that uh, and I think the board will probably be releasing a plan soon sort of in response to that um, to try to but it's it's a big problem and and I have thought long and hard about what the answer can be other than allowing the staff to assess voters um, and that raises its own concerns around elder care abuse etc um, but it's a really imperfect area of voting right now is what do people do in nursing homes when their family can't come see them and help them and when a multi-partisan assistance team can't come see them and help them. We've got a lot of concerns about whether absentee ballots are going to be counted and how we can make sure that absentee ballots are counted. Can you help to uh, relieve some of our, our concerns about that? Sure. Um, so absentee ballots are regular ballots. Um, once they are received, uh, if the, the form on the back has been properly signed and witnessed, uh, your ballot's going to be counted, just like anybody else's ballot. Um, the marginal problem with absentee ballots is that I know if I go vote at an early voting site, once I put my ballot in the tabulator, barring some extraordinary event, I know that that ballot's been counted and that my vote will count. Um, of course, I understand why people have anxiety about not seeing that process, uh, knowing that there are several sort of links in the chain that can break along the way. So um, you might have a problem with the postal service and it doesn't get delivered in time. Um, you could potentially have the problem of, uh, you know, your witness making a mistake and not putting their address. And so it being rejected for that reason. Um, so the key and uh, on the on the witness form portion, I will say the state board has redesigned the envelope such as much clearer to read and the instructions are clear and it says like first the voter must sign here second the witness must sign and provide their name and address here um, so that will uh, that alone will cure a lot of those problems um, the mail problems are separate and apart uh, and of course we're seeing sort of these attacks on the postal service and that's why I encourage people who want to vote by mail like myself um, to mail it in as soon as you can and and that way that you can check and make sure it got there you know well before early voting even begins so okay. um some people are concerned about safety at in-person voting will masks be required at in-person voting um so masks likely won't be required um they'll be highly recommended uh all poll workers are being required to wear gloves, masks, and face shields. Um, so poll workers will be wearing full PPE. Um, you can't make someone wear a mask to vote, uh, you know, the, the, and, and that would be, you know, and I have concerns about how that would be, um, you know, sort of disparately applied to in marginalized communities, how that, you know, some people would be turned away and others wouldn't. Um, so I think the key is that, you know, those facilities are going to be very large, uh, People are going to be required to social distance, and if someone is worried about that, just go at an off hour. You know, early voting sites are open from 7:30 and or 8:30 in the morning until 7:30 at night um, throughout the early voting period. If you go early on Tuesday morning, there's probably not going to be very many people there. And so, for folks who are who are worried about it, I, I think early voting um, is is really the best option. Okay, some more concerns about absentee ballots are exact match signatures required. And I mean, who determines that something about an absentee ballot is not valid? And what recourse do we have to, to challenge that determination? Certainly. Um, so we don't have signature match in North Carolina. Uh, that is an invalid science bunk science signature match you cannot have somebody testify to a signature match in court because it's not legitimate um, and we don't have it and that's very good in place we have the witness requirement that's how we verify who the voter is on our absentee ballots um, so problems that could arise the most common reason that absentee ballots are rejected um, is that they arrive late and so you know typically people if you mail it the monday before the election it might not get there by friday um, the second most common reason is that the voter didn't read the form at all on the back and didn't sign it themselves didn't get a witness they just put the ballot in the envelope and mailed it um, by having a clear form on the back we're hoping to catch most of that uh, the the added requirement that the witness provide 
their name and address as a little bit of a challenge because I have seen ballots rejected because the witness signed, wrote their name, and then wrote the town that they lived in, wrote Chapel Hill, North Carolina, rather than putting their address. So that's a reason for rejecting a ballot. It requires that you provide um, an address, a physical address uh, of where the witness lives. Um, those, those are rare instances that that occurs, and the key is just to read it and follow the instructions as presented and to mail it in in time that it arrives. Could you clarify year. for us what the deadline is for actually having your ballot postmarked to, mm -hmm. to, send to the Board of Elections? If you were to postmark it on election day and it were received a few days later, is it still a valid ballot? So an absentee ballot must be postmarked by election day and received by the Friday after election day, so three days later at 5 p.m. Um, so it's feasible that you could put a ballot in the mail on election day um, that doesn't arrive in time. Uh, and, and I've seen where voters, particularly out of state voters, you know, mailed it on Monday or Tuesday and it didn't get there by Friday. It came you know, the following week. Uh, so again, it's just another place that I encourage people to do it early. Well, and where exactly can people deliver the absentee ballot? Other than uh, you, what, how else can they deliver it? So an absentee ballot can be hand delivered to an early voting site or to the Board of Elections office. So if a voter, for example, uh, that election day example, um, if a voter is realize they didn't turn in their absentee ballot, they're better off going to the Board of Elections that day and turning it in by five o'clock, probably than they are by putting it in the mail. Um, similarly, and one of the great things about the, the early voting site thing uh, is that, you know, if you had older parents who wanted to vote by mail, um, you could go vote early in person and take their two ballots with, with you as a close relative uh, and deliver their ballots you know, in person uh, such that you knew it was received at that early voting site. Okay. Um, would you recommend reaching out to voters who typically vote on election day to inform them of other ways to vote? Uh, I, well, I'll, I'll let you jump in there, Seth, too. But I, what I would say is, you know, when you're talking to people who absolutely uh, vote on election day, don't try to dissuade them from that, but let them know that, um, that there are, especially if you realize demographically, uh, that they could be at risk for being out in the elements and around others who could be infected, that you do share with them that, um, you know, voting by mail, um, you know, well in advance is an option. Um, and then, you know, giving them the direct, uh, the specific information about voting in, in person and early uh, is, is what I think can get them to, to not be in the line on election day. We have some people, as long as I've been involved in politics, uh, they absolutely want to vote on election day, but uh, I would I would arm them with information and let them make a good decision. And you know, adding to that, sort of philosophically speaking, um, I think about getting you know getting out the vote. We are not trying to change the way that people vote because of this pandemic. We are trying to make sure that people vote and that they do it in the way that is most comfortable and best for them, despite the pandemic. So if someone is a person who wants to go vote in person, I'm, I'm never going to try to convince them to do otherwise. I'm just going to make sure that they know they can do it safely. And here are the times you can do it. Someone wants to vote by mail. I'm not going to try to dissuade them from doing that. I'm going to try to make sure that they have all the resources they need to, to ensure that their ballots are counted. So we are just trying to get people to vote and it should be up to them how they do it. That's right. Okay, and one um, voter asked, how can we, um, where do we go to make sure that our ballot was received and accepted? Uh, so you can go to the State Board of Elections website. They have something that's called the Voter Registration Lookup Tool. Uh, and you can look up your voter record uh, and see whether your ballot has been received and accepted on that record. Uh, so if you just type in your name and scroll to the bottom of that page uh, and it says like absentee request history um, and it will either say valid return or invalid return uh, and it, so if, if it's an invalid return it means it was rejected 
now that we have a cure process, there will be some notification to you other than having to go look it up yourself. We haven't previously had that. Um, but if, it, if you have validly returned your ballot, that means that your ballot has been accepted and, and counted. Okay. And uh, Bonnie, we're nearing the end of our time here. Is there any question that I've overlooked that we should finish up with? Well, there was uh, one person that said, if you drop off your uh, ballot, uh, absentee ballot at early voting, do you have to go inside or will there be, <coughs> excuse me, a box that would prevent them from going inside? <coughs> Sorry. Um, so you have to fill out a form when you deliver it in person. Uh, so, so you will likely have to go inside. Um, I'm advocating with the Board of Elections to allow people to do that curbside as well if they feel most comfortable doing that. So um, not, the statute about curbside voting doesn't really contemplate this in-person absentee ballot return because um, it's just never really been an issue. Not that many people voted by mail. And so I'm, I'm trying to ensure that if people would prefer to drop off a ballot curbside, they can. But that's not been set in stone yet and and may vary from county to county and and you know if i'm not able to get the state board of elections to say that they can accept them um curbside it may vary from county to county what the county board decides about that and then yeah. where do where do we go for the most up-to-date information voter information with some of these issues that haven't been clarified or may change where is the best place to go for updated information yeah our our um state board of elections our new director is uh, executive director is just she's absolutely fantastic um uh, they are doing a really good job of updating things as they come out and they're also um taking it to social media so if you follow them on i think it's at least twitter uh they are starting to put out videos to to really outline in a minute or less um some of the things you should watch out for absolute ways um, that you can you know cast your ballot appropriately so they're they're being more aggressive uh, than ever to make sure that uh, uh, that people have what they need and not to mention the general assembly um gave them more money so that they can also uh, do more outreach we will include that link in our follow-up email to everyone i know the county boards of the election are very good as well and the state so because nothing like going straight to the source as opposed to speculating with your neighbor so I would encourage everyone to go to these sites. Anything else? Uh, I would just say thank you for um, for the opportunity for Seth and I. And I know, you know, he he loves this stuff. He eats it, breathes it, and sleeps it every day. Um, but I think it's it's just important. So I've been taking notes uh, so that for things that were not clear, we hopefully can work together and make sure that we, that we get the clarification from the Board of Elections and as we go back in September, that we try to make this process even more clear because just with all the questions you've had today, it shows, and you're informed voters. So think about those who just have a lot going on and don't have the time to invest. And so thank you for, for being um, so amazing and thank you for being interested um, in helping us flip the North Carolina House. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, thank, thank you so much for being here tonight. And before everybody goes, we just want to close out with some final announcements for all the neighbors. First, like Susan said, we're going to follow up with an email and I will include the voter hotline number and all those links. And to please remember to sign up for two phone banks and neighbors on call for August. September 4th is when those absentee ballots start going out. So that is not very long before people could start voting. So we are doing really important work in August. We'd also like you to join us for our next event, which is next Wednesday, August 19th. Tom Jensen, the Director of Public Policy Polling, is gonna give us a peek into what the latest polls are saying about the North Carolina legislative races. And save the date, we're having a big knock virtual pep rally on September 2nd. The details are gonna come soon, but here's a little hint, and you should put your guests in the chat. We have a special guest coming whose name rhymes with Leb Cutler. So put your guesses in <laughs> and we hope that you will join us for that. Um, and thank you again so much, Seth and Zach, for all this great information and answering our many, many questions. 
Yes, thank you so much. I think we, there's never been such a time as this, this election is so different from any, any of us have been through before. So thank you so much. It's good to know you're there helping us out. And no one's guessing it. <laughs> well, you'll all have to be in suspense. All right, you'll find out in the, in the email on Monday. All righty, folks. Well. Oh, yay, someone got it. Oh, did they? Good. Yeah, Butler. <laughs> all right. Good night, everybody. Night. Love you all. Be good. <laughs>